So hello everyone, welcome back. Sorry, that was a very short break. I hope you managed to get your teas or coffees quickly. So without further delay, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Lucy Natarajan from the Bartlett, who will be chairing uh, the next panel discussion on repairing the social fabric. So uh, Lucy works at UCL and focuses on uh, regional inequality in the UK and diversity in planning. So uh, Lucy, are you there? On to you then. Hi, hello everybody. Um, thank you very much. I, as you say, all of my research is about participatory planning. Um, I look at uh, decision-making on different types of urban projects. So this is everything from major infrastructure stations to clean air strategies. Um, I'm always happy to be involved in events like this, which are about connecting policies and communities. And I think um, it's really important to think about what we mean by inclusion, um, because participation and inclusion are not at all the same thing. Uh, and I think the challenge for the white paper will be, um, in relation to today's topic, it will be uh, about treating different types of places equitably. So just very briefly, um, this relates to my recent work with the UK 2070 Commission. Um, and uh, the latest report is available, obviously free to access online. Uh, the UK 2670 Commission looks at inequality in the UK and places that are left behind what people sometimes call legacy cities. So many of the places that uh, we've been looking at with the UK 2070 Commission um, have a great deal of industrial heritage. But what's really interesting, of course, um, and troubling is that the industries themselves have disappeared. So if you think about mining towns and villages in the north of England, the physical forms of these places, the, the housing, the town halls and so on, they all remain. And so does the social fabric. Large parts of the community will identify with these past industries and really see it as part of their identity. So, of course, this echoes Nicoletta's points from the previous session that are encouraging us to think about social fabric in a deeper way. Um, and what I think often is forgotten is how certain types of social fabric might be excluded from policy thinking. So um, this is about how to ensure that the, the protections that are provided by any system of planning are not just for famous heritage cities, but can also uh, talk to the important everyday social fabric, um, traditional ways of living and so on. Uh, now, uh, our speakers know far more about um, heritage, heritage than I do, and I'm gonna hand over to them now, just briefly to introduce. Uh, we have David Bryan from Extend UK. Um, we have Helen Fadipe from PFF Associated and Claire Smith from the University of York. Hello, hi, welcome. Um, Alafian Taiwo was going to join us. I'm not sure she is, uh, but um, you'll correct me if I'm wrong there, please. Um, so everybody's going to speak for around about 10 minutes. Um, and I, I will uh, give you a, a sound to alert you like this. Um, and um, I, I, I've just introduced very briefly one by one and ask you to start and keep it on the time if that's okay speakers. So um, thanks very much. First of all, let's hear from David, shall we? And I, I suggest that in our session, should we do as we did with the previous ones where we close our videos and then we reopen again when we, when we switch over and we'll have a speaker by spe speaker and then take questions at the end for everybody together. Does that work? Does that sound okay? Yeah. Right. So thank you. So David, over to you. Hi there, everybody. Um, you can see in your screens a picture of uh, a new project, but let me just leave that picture there while I talk generally about um, uh, this issue from my perspective. So I, I come from a practitioner's point of view, which is I'm working with three arts organisations, um, uh, each with a very strong commitment to the local area in which they are located or in one case, to the development of local communities having uh, greater engagement in the local arts and developing uh, in that uh, process, the kind of affirmation of local groups who often in, this, in, that, in one case, um, in most cases, are working with minimal funding or no funding at all. So, I work for, so I'm a chair of Voluntary Arts, which is an organization that spans across the whole UK. So we've got, uh, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, um, and as part of and Wales as part of our organization. Um, and we work with small groups in each of those countries on a variety of different very local projects. Um, as it happens today, we have 
um, EPIC Awards, an annual event that uh, celebrates local uh, groups engaging in uh, developing projects that enhance the welfare of local people, their well-being, and their sense of place. Um, and that program will therefore uh, celebrate the energy and the drive of local individuals who put themselves out to make events for the over 70s dance group or men talking about emotional challenges or um, local groups talking about their cultures uh, from refugee countries coming together to make something new and different. A wide variety of cultural expression that is about enabling those groups to say we are in a location and because of age, because of cultural differences, we still take value and importance in where we are and want to develop that as part of the community. The picture you've got in front of you is about a new development. Uh, it's, it's under construction as we speak. Um, it's a new project that's in Brixton. It was uh, at the relocation of a theatre in a South London community called the Oval, opposite the cricket ground, if any of you are into that sport, but now it's being built in the center of Brixton. Um, and this now is a new development trying to affirm what has been a long gap in Brixton, it, in its cultural vitality at least, um, a place where theater, a place where dance, a place where spoken word can be uh, seen. Brixton for all its vibrant social life didn't have uh, uh, for many years a place where those additional expressions could be performed and engaged with locally. Um, and that I think is, is really important because it's part of a place where local stories can be heard, a place where local, local um, creativity can be expressed. And that creativity, not merely in terms of uh, the theater, but we also will in, within this building have space for community groups to come and explore their thoughts on a variety of issues, as well as provide sport, and uh, not sport, but I think um, healthy activities, I should say, for going forward. Why is this topic important to me? I think this topic is important to me because I wanna kind of begin at a different place. I think it's in, uh, I'm indifferent to the issue of the speed of, of delivery. I'm indifferent to the way in which this fine tuning and streamlining might make the process work better. Because I think regardless of that, my worry is that it will continue to exclude the communities that are being made to feel irrelevant by the processes uh, previously. A better process of making communities feel irrelevant is not gonna solve the problem. And I think that's, what I, that's my feeling about what is taking place in a large number of communities around the country. That um, the usual power brokers are making decisions about what is good for the community and, um, and avoiding the difficult conversations that need to be had about how to create balance, how to affirm communities that have been there for a long while, how to enable the new and the old and the different to coalesce in a constructive arena and place. People often talk about access as if access is about um, disability, um, uh, about finance, um, uh, but I think it's also about race, it's also about class differences. And these again are two topics that seem not to exist in many of the policy documents I'm reading. Um, it would presume that everywhere is safe and open for everyone to go to. But from, if you're from a, a cultural background or if you're, a, you know, you're from a working class background, some places are still quite hostile, if not unpleasant to be engaged with. You're made to feel unwelcomed, unwanted. That's as much about urban town creative centers as it is about the countryside itself. Will one be safe when one goes there? Um, uh, is, is the environment conducive or responsive or respectful? Moving forward, if we, what we do need to do is, is, is work out how to construct the kinds of dialogues within communities that we can build over time. So the civic fabric can begin to be one based on intelligent, open, honest conversations. That civil fabric can begin to um, address uncomfortable issues, um, be it, be it uh, how do we 
work together to make a better social environment so that everybody can feel comfortable and therefore be themselves? Or what kinds of historical um, uh, statues or other edifices need to be removed, renamed, reinvented in order that uh, we have a cleaner, reimagined future? We avoid all these conversations, it seems to me, endlessly. And I think it's at our own cost because we do need to grapple with what makes a place safe, what makes a place beneficial. We've got a task with this new, new building to build social networks, to open up connections with communities and enable them to have a voice, to go through that turbulent journey of the outsiders who withdrawn because no one's been listening, to those who feel passionate and, and, and engaged in a very specific or very narrow terrain of interest. But that's got to be done over a period of time and that requires us engaging communities, being more inclusive and finding the means by which they can take ownership of something like this. So for me, this represents a venture into building alliances, building confidence and building the strength of communities to have a foothold in the future. And I think it's important that the foothold they have in the future is one that is not in an old building that's in decline, not in a space where they're forever trying to patch it up, or not in a space that's overly expensive. Because what one's also seeing in many places is that communities are being priced out. The spaces that they once were able to secure, local authority, community halls that were cheap, or libraries, or even church spaces, are constantly being, um, uh, uh, constantly raising their costs. So community groups who are volunteers, who are coming together because they feel a passion for keeping their lives vibrant and active are being priced out of the process. This escalation of monetizing everything around us, I think is detrimental to communities' sustainability, let alone cohesion. So for me, that's why I'm, I'm very keen on this issue of how we build going forward because I think we're, we need, therefore, to build um, honest conversations. And whether we start that early with young people in schools um, or we just find ways of continuing to create avenues for that, it seems to me that we do need a better educational process um, that is done by those groups that exist, by academics, by cultural centers, by everyone that begins to acknowledge the real challenges we have in facing the the, 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 the complexity of our environment. Our environment is now a big issue for us, but also the complexity of our social relations between each other. Because if we don't conquer both of those challenges, we will therefore continue to be sliding into very difficult terrains and wondering how we ever got there. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was... Uh... <laughs> Perfect timing um, coming in on the gong. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, I think, as I said, uh, what we'll do now is, if it's okay, then we'll go straight to our next speaker and have questions at the end. Please do keep the questions coming in the chat. Um, please uh, join us now, if you will, Helen. Um, and uh, Helen's contribution, while she's going to focus on gender and race, she's also going to touch upon all of the aspects of uh, the community and how the use of digital intelligence, emotional intelligence and inclusion intelligence can be used to repair a social fabric. When you're ready, thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, I, um, I, um, <clears throat> I, I was going to say thanks for having me. Um, I've had a lot of speaking engagements this week, so my voice, you know, um, is a little bit dry, so do pardon the, the sound of my voice. Um, I will try to speak up so that you can hear me. Um, so as has been said by Lucy, my contribution will focus on gender and race, and I will also be touching on all aspects of the community and how the use of digital intelligence, emotional intelligence and inclusion can be used to repair the social fabric. 
I would like to start off by speaking about the Onward Repairing a Social Fabric Research Program, which was launched in March of 2020. That particular research showed that the strength of community has declined over time. And it looked at five key areas, mainly the strength of social relationships, the quality of civic institutions, the acceptance of positive social norms, and the value of its local economy and the levels of physical infrastructure. And one of the interesting findings from a town planner perspective is the fact that the decline in the social fabric also leads to inequalities. And that particular study was able to, to, to look at areas where there were very strong social fabrics compared to areas that had a, um, you know, um, a high level of deprivation. And so when we're talking about the social fabric in terms of its decline and repairing, we should be aware that it touches every aspect of every individual's life. And so what exactly makes the social fabric not to be so cohesive? The first thing I'd like to talk about is that the sense of belonging is often lacking in areas that has experienced high growth. There is, this, there is that lack of sense of belonging. You know, people don't feel that they are rooted. There are issues of trust. There's issues of securities. And in most cases, these are mainly in the urban areas, the areas that are being targeted for growth, the areas that are being targeted in the white paper for renewal. And so being conscious of how all these feelings affect the social fabric is quite important. And so that then brings me to the, um, to the main question, how then can we repair the social fabric? And I'd like to state that we have to start by focusing on areas that we need to strengthen and to build on. And this includes the sense of purpose. Local communities have to have that sense of purpose in terms of being able to come together to help each other, feeling of mutual trust and respect. That we promote the sense of belonging and security. And when as planners, we are looking at planning new, new spaces, we have to think about how to do that intelligently. And so I'm promoting that we need to be able to deploy digital intelligence, emotional intelligence, and inclusion intelligence in terms of looking at how we begin to move forward and narrow the gap in terms of the inequalities. When we talk about digital intelligence, of course, the planning white paper has already seized, seized on that initiative. And this was brought about by the opportunity which was presented by COVID-19, the lockdown. Many planning authorities, you know, um, you know, every single one of them, if I may say so, went digital. Committee meetings, site visits, public inquiry, everything went digital. It was all virtual. And because of this phase that we are going through, the digital world has come to the fore in the planning profession. And so the planning white paper is seizing on that and it's asking that all planning, all planning consultation should take place digitally. And so it's important for us to look at what this would mean in terms of repairing the social fabric. We are, of course, aware that social media such as Snapchat, uh, you know, Snapchat, Instagram, TikToks, are the media of choice for the younger generation. And being able to engage them in that digital sphere will be key to gaining their participation. However, due care has to be taken not to eliminate the older generation who often may not have access to digital media. In addition, not everyone is able to understand and read plans. And we have to find ways to engage with those group of people too. Being able to use the, the, the phone, you know, it doesn't mean people can read plans. People may not be able to interpret what that space will look like when it is built. 
As a planner, I've often had instances of spending time with elderly residents to explain what is being developed in their neighborhood. And this also goes for, for people who, whose, whose first language is not English. And so when we're talking about going digital in planning as proposed by the white paper, we have to think of all those people who cannot engage in the process because they do not understand the process. And so care has to be taken. And similar to the real world, the use of social media would have to be targeted. A majority of people are not registered to receive email communication from their local authorities. Therefore, platforms frequently used by different groups such as women, Blacks, Asian and ethnic minority groups will have to be targeted. This will require sharing knowledge and database. And that brought back to my mind Cambridge Analytical. How much of that information will be available? How would local authorities know which platforms are actively used by their local residents? The second intelligence that we need to also deploy is, is emotional intelligence. In going digital, the planning profession will have to create and foster local communities who are able to gather around projects and discuss this either in a virtual or physical space. It's not just enough to just ask people to tick boxes. The main thing is we want to repair the social fabric and so that sense of community sense of belonging is going to be critical. And the emotional intelligence also calls for reducing ambiguity in the planning process. We have to use languages that the communities can easily relate to. And that may require deploying different style of writing, adverts for the targeted audience. It can't be one size fits all. And so that is what we need to think about more emotionally. Yes, we are going digital. However, how will this relate? And we have to begin to take note of, of the differences that exist within our society. And then that brings me to the inclusion intelligence. And this includes that realization I've just spoken about that groups or communities such as the BAME it's not homogeneous. People with disability is not homogeneous. There are women, men, you know, and of course, gender plays a critical part in talking about inclusion. And so the, you know, and so the spaces that are being created will have to be accessed and used in different ways. How do we capture this? How do we, um, you know, how do we, um, you know, engage and involve all these different sectors of the community, you know, of the community. Therefore, what I am promoting is that we need to consider the tools we employ in collaborating and gaining consensus. What motivates a person to engage in a process may not be of interest to another person. What interests me as a woman may not interest a man. And so we have to start to think about gender, you know, when you want to engage a man, do you need to target them through ads when, the, when there is a football match? You know, is that the best way that you can engage them to get them to start to talk about the environment and what they need for them for their local area? Understanding this will require the use of focus groups drawn from different sections of the community to tease out their motivational factors. Inclusion can be enhanced through the use of participatory planning in marginalized neighborhoods. The shared experience of living within the area, allowing local communities to shape their space. However, it has to be noted that if these needs that the communities are going to express through the local plans, through the, through the neighborhood plans and the design codes, if they are not met, it can lead to disenfranchisement and the process can be seen as tokenism. The white paper seeks to retain neighborhood planning. This is welcomed. However, not all communities are able to engage effectively and there must be a mechanism for obtaining data 
on the ethnicity of the groups of individuals who are involved in the projects, in the process. We all know there are inequalities in participation. The speaker before me spoke about that at length. It is well documented, lots of research papers has been done of the inequalities between planners and participants to shape participation process and outcomes. We have inequalities between participants as well, participant to participant, in terms of different interest groups and different interests. And often it is who speaks the loudest that gets the biggest share. It will be very, very interesting to look at, to, 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 to see what comes out of this white paper consultation and our participation in the local planning, uh, in the local plan, neighbor plan process will begin to experience, we begin to enhance that experience and promote shared value of space and heritage. One of the questions in my mind is what mechanisms will be in place to ensure that every voice is heard and interest groups do not hijack the agenda to the detriment of other users. For example, restricting car parking spaces, which is not proportionate <clears throat> to public transport provision. Oftentimes, women are the carers. They are the nurturers, those who nurture in society. And often, they have to take their children to school, take their elderly parents to the clinic. I live in the part of the world when I moved in, there was a bus stop less than two minutes from where I live. Right now, that bus stop has been stopped up. There is no more bus. The nearest bus stop to where I live now is 30 minutes. Why? We were told people do not use the bus service. What then happened? The local surgery, the car parking spaces, we are then, you know, um, we are then being prized. And so you then find inequalities happening even by trying to promote the use of public transport, you are also increasing the, 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 the cost of parking. Who pays that price is often those who are marginalized, who often pay that price. In conclusion, I would like to state that promoting shared value, we require policy and placemakers to take into account women's nurturing and caring role in the societies, the diverse ethnic groups, the physical and mental abilities of residents that live in our communities, ensuring that space is designed to reflect the society. Safeguarding the built, the, the, um, safeguarding the built heritage and ensuring that in changing the planning system, our societal values are not eroded further and we can indeed begin to repair the social fabric. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Fantastic. Um, and I, as I said, we'll um, we'll take questions on this at, at the end. Um, but uh, now we'll hand over to uh, Claire Smith. Hi, Claire. Um, so uh, Claire is going to talk about her uh, her work on the community led heritage stra strategy. Over to you, um, and uh, I will give you a gong in about ten minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, Right, I will just start sharing my screen. So hi, yeah, I'm Claire, um, and I've been working with a group called Joined Up Heritage Sheffield. Here they are, hopefully you can see them all. Um, and it's been, I've been working with them on a community-led heritage strategy, which I'm gonna offer to you now as um, an example of um, one of the event questions for today about what it means when resources are in the hands of communities. Um, so firstly, just so that we're all on the same page, what exactly am I meaning when I'm talking about heritage strategy? Well, um, I'm talking about uh, the specific documents that are normally produced by or commissioned by local planning authorities to set out a framework for how heritage related decision making um, policy making and wider activities um, are going to be taken forward. The National Planning Policy Framework, paragraph 185, uh, requires LPAs to set out some sort of heritage strategy. 
But um, this heritage strategy with Joined Up Heritage Sheffield is a bit different um, because it's initiated and led by and facilitated by local people. So it's not just um, community engagement, it is completely community led. Um, Joined Up Heritage Sheffield, they're a community group who are a, a forum for um, heritage organisations and interested individuals in the city of Sheffield. Um, and the strategy, which I've been working with them on as a consultant, um, was produced in a really collaborative way um, through a series of workshops that led to a framework and then another series of workshops which built on that to draft the strategy. And then two rounds of really meaningful um, consultation, which led to a raft of changes, um, which I've just finished writing up, ready for publication of the strategy. So to return to the event question about what it means when resources are in the hands of communities, and also the one around um, understanding and uh, the governance of placemaking, um, and how that affects um, well-being and social sustainability, I have turned to the RSA's five British giants from um, 2018. So according to that piece of work by the RSA, um, the um, biggest challenges facing 20th century British society are inequality, isolation, intolerance, disempowerment, and the environment. And I feel that the control of the heritage strategy in the hands of Joined Up Heritage Sheffield tackles at least three of these issues. Um, I feel like the content and implementation does cover all of them. Um, but, you know, just for time, we're going to focus on these three. Um, so firstly, let's deal with environment. It's a heritage strategy, so mostly the historic environment, incorporating um, natural um, heritage, designed landscapes, open spaces, um, all of that, of course. Um, but in terms of tackling um, environment, the RSA recognises that people have a real concern for their environment, not just environment in terms of those natural spaces, but environment as in the places we live, work and are connected to. And the strategy gives voice and choice over the direction for historic environment management in Sheffield going forward. Um, it also tackles inequality. Um, it, the process of um, developing this strategy gave equal voice to local community individuals and um, professional organisations. So in that way, it, some, it sort of challenged and um, addressed some of the balances of power that we've got in the, the planning process normally. Um, and also the RSA defines this idea of equality, inequality, um, not just about people, people, but spatial inequality too. So that's about um, people in a place looking at other places and thinking, well, hang on a minute, they're getting, they're getting more resource or they're getting more benefits out of um, heritage in this case than we are. So the strategy tackles inequality um, by um, seeking to compare Sheffield with other um, places of the similar size and also inequality um, within Sheffield, um, looking at um, communities within Sheffield, are they gaining the same benefits from heritage equally across, um, across Sheffield, like building on like more recent work from the RSA about heritage for inclusive growth. Um, finally, probably a really obvious one, um, empowerment. Um, obviously the strategy tackles disempowerment by um, Joined Up Heritage Sheffield stepping into a role which is normally um, controlled um, by local planning authorities, even if they're devolving that power um, in part by consultation or really participatory work. Um, and so hundreds of people have been empowered through this process to contribute, um, to have their view listened to and incorporated in the strategy. I tried really hard to 
not just incorporate people's ideas from the workshops in the strategy, but actually where possible, just take it through in exactly the way that they articulated it. Um, so finally, obviously we were asked to think about the, the planning white paper. I'm going to do this very loosely and broadly. Um, so apologies for, for that. And I hope to learn more in the next panel um, about this. But the main challenge I see is around um, zonal and rural based planning. I know that it, it happens in, in other countries, but I don't know very much about it. Um, the consensus from the Sheffield group and obviously more widely in English and um, international heritage community is that heritage is everywhere. It's a backdrop to everyday life and is for all or should be for all. So zones of growth, renewal and protection seems to be in conflict with that. Um, if heritage is only to be deemed in one or two of those categories. And we have to hope that perhaps in terms of building better, building beautiful, heritage can be seen as part of the beautiful and therefore might be able to go through more holistically. And the opportunity I see going forward um, is actually more of a reminder, really, that the kind of work that this is does not happen because of or within policy. Um, I mentioned that the MPPF directs LPAs to have a heritage strategy, but of course it does not direct the kinds of participative work that is being undertaken by local planning authorities at the moment. So things like um, creating heritage forums, um, or in Nottingham's case here, a heritage partnership, um, which are providing models for long-term public engagement in heritage activity, which are beyond tokenism and letting people engage on a strategic and directional level. And of course, joined up Heritage Sheffield strategy goes much further in being completely community-led and community-run and intending to see that through in its implementation too. So the opportunities for communities to be empowered or take control, I think exists in some ways regardless of um, planning policy and reflects other agents, agencies active in our heritage sector and planning sectors. So as long as we think creatively, innovatively and boldly, I hope that um, these opportunities will not disappear. So much. Um, in fact, I, I must admit to being so engrossed in what you were talking about I didn't look to my gong, but I didn't also need it. You kept the time very nicely. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Helen and David, um, if, if you don't mind uh, at this point coming back in, thanks so much. And we can all take our, ourselves off of mute. Um, I'm really, um, uh, really happy to hear all your presentations. And um, I think that there's a very interesting um, point of commonality from from my listening to you uh, that's coming out around the the ways that that there are inherently conflicts within understandings of place and heritage and um and that this can affect as david said very much the way that uh, you know how people then relate to the processes of participation and inclusion um, and uh, and I do have questions of my own which I'm happy to come back to but I, I think for the the you know the, the purpose of today it, it's better to go straight to the questions that people have put and I will read them out verbatim so please do now if you have um, not yet put your question to our participants please do carry on typing them in and so I'll start uh, and I'll, I'll deal with them in order as they come in as well. So uh, Harriet, thank you for your point here. And you're, you're saying um, after David's presentation, you, you wrote this question about your concern that older participants um, uh, are in planning are being viewed as boring. Um, and in Enfield that you have a heritage strategy that uh, was a shared production and everybody pushed to bring in the young, the young, the young um, and the usual suspects though were such an important part of the mix. Um, how do we allow, so the question from Harriet here, how do we allow those who are too keen or different to express their views if even if these are half-baked or boring or inconvenient? And how do we accommodate those untidy views? So um, the, the question was to David, but I'm sure that uh, you know, Claire and Helen might uh, have 
uh, contributions on that as well. So David, maybe first. Um, let me kick off then. Um, yeah. I, I think that um, we have to create a space that's conducive for, for a range of ideas and a range of inputs. Um, I think listening is really invaluable and often we are um, in, in many of these kind of events or facilitated activities um, that I've witnessed in local authorities, there's a presentation on this is the this is the issue we want you to focus on and don't deviate in any way that that doesn't feel comfortable. I think we have to be therefore much more actively engaged in listening to a range of voices, a range of opinions, um, and 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 give it the respect because there may be something that in that spectrum of ideas that we hadn't thought about that really has an important impact. And I think that the question about um, balancing our, our enthusiasm for young people with hearing everybody else is really important. I just think it's too fashionable now to say, where are they young? Where are they young? As if somehow only they have the, the insight and the, the kind of virtues for the future. I mean, certainly it is their future, but we shouldn't discount the whole community. There's no point doing saying we are inclusive if on one hand and on the other hand we exclude the old because we're saying your time is done uh, so i think it's about better listening better engagement and and thinking through what are some of the opportunities that uh, are coming at us in different ways thank you um helen and claire did you want to add anything to that um, yes um my experience um in doing um, various forms of public consultation, you know, often shows that yes, you will get divergent views, and you will get people who may, you know, who you know who do not want to conform and answer those particular questions we are asking. It's important to take note of all those opinions, and often what's lacking from a good public consultation exercise is feedback. And what I have done in the past when I've led those sessions, because in my, in my, uh, in my past, I've been in charge of plans, I've, you know, I've engaged with various people in terms of getting them on board. And what I always strove to, to do, and I always encourage those that, that, that I managed to do is provide feedback it's quite important when you engage to provide feedback and to explain why those views are not being taken into account. And that feedback should be to everyone and it should be transparent. And if possible, it should be documented in terms of what the issues are, why they are being discounted. And of course, if there are ways that you can use those particular views in future, then do so. But it's important to carry people along to make sure that they feel empowered. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And um, Helen, sorry, I'm just, I want to use my chair's privilege in a way here because it was um, something I thought about when you were talking um, around the responsibility for that review process. Um, you were talking about, you know, the challenge of different issues maybe not being heard and um, and that um, it's important that uh, to review the sorts of uh, feedback you get during a, a consultation process. And I'm just wondering about uh, what you would say around responsibilities for that review, because um, th there's a point at which that must coalesce together. So it's not something that can be done necessarily collaboratively with everyone at, together. Yeah, well, um, my experience in local authorities is often left to the planners to review the information that they got. And of course, they then use the governance process, which means that they have to report it back to the elected members. And so elected members then, um, as those, you know, as the custodians of the society that they live in, they then respond to whatever the planners present to them. So in a way, it's still collaborative. Yeah. Um, you know, it can go further. You know, um, you could have a panel that could come together to review and make a decision collectively. And that panel, again, should be representative of both the young and the old, of gender, race, so that at least they own that process. It's not just planners saying, this is what we feel, A equals B, B is not C. 
and members at times may not be in a position to engage. So then opportunities are missed. So it's looking at how we review the information that we get and how we then feedback that, you know, that information. Thank you very much. Um, shall we go on to the next question? Or Claire, did you want to add anything to that? Let, let's go, yeah, let's go. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we've got a lot to get through, sorry. So um, the, the, the next question from an anonymous attendee, um, uh, asking about, um, as we think of the needs of the poorest in society, wondering whether the subscription institution, so here yeah, I'm guessing, uh, you know, mem membership bodies for professional associations and, and others, uh, could be encouraged to more be more proactive in allocating some of their income to benefit those who cannot be afford who cannot afford to subscribe, and also obviously need to experience nature and culture for their well being as well. So, among the net meta narratives of development. Other bodies and institutions who provide funding um, and a and and their terms and conditions are problematic there. So, do these obligations provide opportunities to leverage a positive influence for making better places open to all? So, this is about the responsibility, I suppose, of our institutions, subscription institutions, and how they use their funding and how their their conditions and terms um, might take on board these things. And I, I put that to the panel generally. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering whether there's any uh, insights from your heritage strategy there, Claire, because it struck me when you were talking that, you know, this was very much a, a collaborative collaboration Sheffield wide and that you were dealing with a lot of different institutions and what sorts of conditions and terms, uh, what sort of what were the uh, rules of engagement for them in a way and whether they considered, you know, different sectors of society and how they would encourage them to get on board. Yeah, um, I mean, in the case of Sheffield, this is very open thing because um, within talking about those subscription memberships, of course, in Sheffield, you'd have some of these groups would have maybe a membership category, others wouldn't at all. And there was no requirement to be a member of Joined Up Heritage Sheffield to be in, involved with this. So um, really the accessibility and inclusivity of that was um, about making sure it was promoted in the right places so that everybody knew it was happening who who wanted to come along and participate yeah. um so in that way i suppose it broke down some of those membership barriers and subscription barriers yeah um because there was no requirement for it yeah thanks that's really helpful um so our next question then um uh, and this is about the point that david raised about streamlining or not um and inaccessibility um, and asking how do how do all the panelists see the role of civil society organizations or power-led group uh, people-led groups sorry making sure that democracy principles are met and is there power embedded there so in the civil society organizations and their work do i jump in here absolutely um i think civil society organizations have a really important role to play um i think they have an important role to play in terms of of enabling an ongoing discussion mm -hmm. around place, around engagement, um, and helping a variety of groups um, have their concerns and interests expressed and find co points of commonality. Mm -hmm. I think it was Helen who said earlier on about avoiding groups that want to just champion their own interests without seeing the wider interactions of others. And I think that's really important that we can't be encouraging singular self-interested conversations all the time and not see how there's an interface between our common concerns. Um, but that takes, I think, to some degree, the habit of engagement and not the habit of competing. Mm -hmm. and, all, and all too often we, we, we force groups to compete for resources, compete for airspace, as opposed to say, what can we do together? So I think the more those civic organizations can mm -hmm. construct regular conversations, I don't mean every week, but more frequent than, than not, then it means that folk have a point of entry, they have yeah. a way of developing their skills and their understanding. So I think it's really very important. Yeah. Um, and in a way, this relates to the next question, exactly the answer you gave there, David, um, which, which is asking about, um, in, in relation to the Sheffield strategy that Claire was talking about, about choices um, on go it, it, as you move forward, 
choices on, for example, preservation of buildings and townscapes um, and how you offer then choices to the community about what they want and particularly where there might be um, conflict with development economic or de economic objectives, as it were. Mm. Um, so I think this kind of looks at the kind of practical application of structure strategy and how you get go from rhetoric to application in planning. Um, and I think it's important to mention that this is where there is a need for a, a local planning authority to be cooperative and happy. Um, uh, and so it kind of requires their power and input um, to make any change in terms of, say, the designation of a conservation area. Um, however, the way it's modelled in other places, um, such as sort of Nottingham, Torbay, Birmingham, would be a heritage um, forum who can then um, lead the shape of the strategy and um, then through an action plan that underpins that with specific projects. So projects can be led by local groups themselves in that way they have that autonomy and are entirely in control of those projects. And in terms of like designation and things, um, so a particular project might be a local list, which we then hope to um, encourage the local planning authority to adopt um, maybe by underpinning it through a local plan policy or as a, um, an SPD um, so that it has some weight in planning. Um, so you could then pr protect those buildings for dem from demolition, for example. So it would be linked to um, a continued voice in the strategic direction and specific project led. I hope that gives an, enough. There's a range of options there, but for example. Yeah. Thank you. So um, this next question is great. It sort of opens it back up to the, the central theme of this particular part of the conference. Uh, it's from Jez Collins. Thank you, Jez. It says, we've heard a lot about the physical manifestations of heritage in relation to planning, but what do the panel think about the role of intangible heritage and this planning discussions? So by this, Jez is meaning the memories, stories, etc., that are so intrinsic to communities and places and tell and often reveal so much about the places we live and work. Let me let me jump in here. Um, I, I think that that the intangible is really vitally important. The intangible um, enables um, us to share stories about places with each other across generations. Um, and and some of that work you, you've seen community groups undertake. Where in one project I'm aware of through voluntary arts, we had school children write into an elderly home um, talking about. Uh, ideas about the future and, and, and getting their views on what happened in the past. And that was a great dialogue between school children and, and retired uh, elders. Um, the, and, and those kind of memories get revisited, those where memories get shared, and there's some intriguing learning uh, in terms of the words and, you, and concepts and, 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 and memories mm -hmm. that um, reference the things that kids will never know about. Um, uh, not merely vinyl, but or other things uh, of, a, of, a, of a bygone period. I think also it's about how memories can be then uh, translated into other things. So there was a project, I think it was in Sheffield, where a group of black men have a regular walking uh, program in, 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 the, in the countryside, and that was then converted into a theatre production. Um, uh, and I, again, it's about the fact that we have these localized histories that are very important. It's not just the stories of the wealthy and well to do that we must cherish and identify with, but much more locally and the variety of them. And I think if we can find ways in which those can be aired on radio, be expressed locally, be shared, then they begin to have um, a significance that says, um, these capture a view of the, the place and the people, otherwise, their stories become just temporary, um, seem to be invalid and seem to be have no worth. And I think what we capture and record seems to be the basis of what we then in future years look back on and say this is of value. Thank you. That's, I, I, I tend to very much agree with you. The, the valorization and the sort of public discourse wider, more widely about these things is, is 
also incredibly significant. Um, five minutes left and um, five questions. Let's see how we get on. Perhaps what I'll do is I'll read out um, a couple at a time and then put it to everybody in, uh, as, yeah, as you have done, thank you, to, to jump in with some brief responses, try and satisfy our audience here. So um, our, our participants really. So um, uh, Barry asks, um, in relation to conservation groups uh, that are recognised in existing planning legis legislation at the national level, so Garden Society, um, SPAB, Georgian Group of Victorian Society, other things. So how can more groups receive statutory recognition? How can local groups be recognised with planning practice so that they consult at an early stage? And I, I, I absolutely appreciate the issue here of lists. Um, and the second question if we do in bundles here, then uh, this is um, actually directly for Helen. Um, you're asking, uh, uh, is, is saying, I can, uh, Kenzum saying um, that they completely agree with your comments regarding inclusion and that as a local authority member in a rural area, um, Kenzum's principal concern lies even earlier in the lack of digital connectivity, uh, which the white paper seems not to acknowledge. So that's the digital intelligence part. Um, so perhaps then maybe Helen, if you don't mind to, to come back on that one directly and then we can talk about the, the organizations. And, and sorry, I beg your pardon, I'm not able to unmute you. Unmute you. <laughs> I will unmute. <laughs> well, um, that's, you know, um, that's a big issue, you know, and we know that there are many rural areas that do not have the internet speed. Most of the planning documents are always very, very heavy in terms of the amount of, you know, um, but by okay bytes and so it will take a long time to actually download and look at the plans and so taking that into account has to be key in terms of how the white paper moves forward you know um okay, at the present time it takes for granted that everyone has you know has equal access everyone have you know has um you know have access to the same speed to the same internet connectivity and that's not the case and I think it's a strong message that we need to send back to say, look, we need to think about people who do not have the same speed. I would like to also come back on the first question you asked, that how can local groups be recognized with planning practice so that they are consulted at an early stage? Most, um, most local authorities have a consultation list. And so um, any group, you can write to your planning department and ask to be, to be, you know, part of that, so that if they are carrying out any consultation, you will be included. And of course, the more included you are, the more you make your presence felt. Then, of course, that comes with the terrain that, in future events, you will always be asked to give your views. And in terms of how does it get into statutory recognition? I think it will depend on your membership. And how far you know, and how far and wide you actually reach. So, if you're just a local group, that cannot then be seen to be statutory. So, you must have a bigger reach in terms of those people that you actually speak for and whom you represent. Thank you, um, Claire and David. I wonder whether you wanted to comment on statutory groups, or should we move to the next? See if we can answer those final three questions. Move on to the next for me. <laughs> yeah. you have well, I, I should admit that I um, I used to work for the Council for British Archaeology, um, who are one of those statutory groups. Um, and um, I agree with Helen that these solutions might be a more local level thing. Um, for example, conservation advisory committees often have a relationship with their local authority where they still exist. Um, and that national statutory remit might not be the answer that you really want because it means being inundated with a lot of planning applications that the group would then have to be able to deal with and and prioritize so it might not be the answer that they're actually looking for good okay uh, i know we started a little late but i'm going to try and finish more or less on time if, 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 it's, uh, if that's okay with you panelists um and uh, so let's take another just two or three minutes to answer these final three questions and i'll i'll go through them all and then we see if we can get brief uh, the responses for, for the participants. So the first of the three, the last questions, 
um, from Martina Tenza. Claire, did you have the feeling that the joined up community group reflect the whole community or rather specific part of society? That's quite a direct question, but then the next to uh, David, you mentioned some groups, the BAME, working class, uh, feel uncomfortable or made feel uncomfortable in the countryside and uh, whether you could uh, just say a little more about that. Um, and what can organisations do, uh, it, the organisations who look after the countryside to help make it more comfortable? Um, and, uh, oh, questions are still coming in. Um, but uh, Kenzen, your, your question is, is similar. It's about uh, the, uh, oh, it's, sorry, it's about monetizing. Um, whether we need to recognise the nuance of that, knowing the value of services um, is really useful but it shouldn't be an excuse for increasing charges. Um, so let's take those three questions if we've got time, Daniel. We'll come back for your final one. So maybe Claire, do you want to talk about that inclusive aspect of your project? Um, yeah, so hi, Martina. We can absolutely talk about this more um, outside of this event if you'd like. Um, did it reflect the whole community or a specific spark? Um, right, this is a really good question. I would say that this was probably one of the most difficult aspects of putting the strategy together. Um, we had some specific events that were targeting different age groups and different sections of society. Um, I think communicating that our aims weren't tokenism to different communities, that we weren't just going out to communities because we wanted to tick the box and say, we've done this, um, was really difficult. Um, and so we decided that because we got we got quite a range of people. Don't don't get me wrong. We did um, I think um, manage to include a lot of people, but we felt it was an area that we still wanted to improve on. And so we put in the action plan a kind of knowledge exchange um, project that we see as being quite a long term thing to um, get, get people's views on how we improve the strategy, make it work better for them and make it a really two-way communication of including all different groups in society. Thanks, Claire. So the next question about the countryside. <laughs> uh, the countryside is a complex one. I think the countryside question is, is, is uh, a curious one from the point of view, on the one hand, so many communities, um, uh, culturally diverse communities come from places that are very much rural, very much greener, very much open, and yet I think feel very un comfortable in, in going to the countryside in the UK, partly because I think it's about the, the concerns that they will not be appropriately received. They'll be abused for being different outside, you know, visibly different. And I think that's not the only group that gets challenged, but that's one that often is very easy to pick on. I think the, the, the way forward with this is partly about the uh, agencies building relationships and being much more proactive in terms of engaging with diverse groups coming in, as well as I think um, identifying what they do internally to make the reception, the reception much more warm, engaging and appropriate. Um, there will certainly be some points of tension because the countryside or, or, some, or some stately homes will have items in them that reflect back to an imperial past. But I think that doesn't mean you avoid the conversation, you just merely embrace it uh, get real about the history and then begin to think what can we do to make this experience now beneficial for everyone and I think avoiding the conversations avoiding the the relationships doesn't get us to move forward to build a shared appreciation of the environment and a shared appreciation of each other so for me I think it's a very it's it's work to build relationships it's work to cultivate artists coming into the areas um, local artists but it's a variety of proactive activity not a way a matter of waiting for the groups to discover that you're a wonderful location with a great landscape wonderful so now uh helen yes yes okay i wanted to just add two points to that particular discussion and the first again is about visibility in most marketing materials showing heritage sites there are not many people from the BME groups being shown. And so that again can discourage BME groups from attending those events or places because it doesn't look inclusive. So inclusivity is also about that kind of 
being visible. Second point I also want to add yes. is that of security. Mm -hmm. At times, PME groups don't go to places because they don't feel secure, because they feel they might be attacked, they may be abused. And so looking at how we address that is going to be important because at times it's not about the organizations, it's, it's about the individuals and users of that space. And so being able to let people know that if you are found to be disrespectful on basis of race, we will not allow you gain entrance anymore. So it's about making sure that, that groups such as the BME can feel welcomed and feel secured, you know, in the, yeah. Thank you very much. I am going to call, thank you so much. And, and in a sense, that's a, a, a point of closure for us, I think, um, about action and moving forward. So um, the, the, the people who've, who didn't maybe um, have the questions answered, oh, please join us for the next uh, session. Um, Hannah, would, uh, would you like to join me in thanking um, and panelists? Uh, thank you very yeah. much, Claire and Her um, Helen and David. Thank yes, you. and thank you to you too, Lucy, of course. And um, just uh, to say about uh, questions, I'm putting them into answered, but panelists can absolutely go and respond to them if they'd like. Um, sorry to say that I'm eating into your 10 minute break. So uh, we'll just take a five minute one. So please do come back at uh, quarter past. Uh, see you there. Thanks, Anna.